Hi everybody, and welcome to our first lecture on the section on magnetism. Um, and in this we're going to talk about how magnets and compasses work and the idea of magnetic fields and magnetic forces. Um, now to begin with, the first studies or records of magnetism, much like electricity, goes back to ancient Greece around 800 BCE. And what they found is there was a rock, I believe in a town called Magnesia, um, that they called magnetite that was found to actually attract small bits of iron. Um, according to what I read, sailors would take this rock and paint one side of it red and hang it from the mast of their ship. Um, and knowing that it always turned and pointed in a particular direction. Um, and essentially that was the first compass. Uh, and we sort of still do that today. A lot of compass needles have one side of them painted red. Maybe a little interesting fact. Anyways, um, all magnets are said to have two poles. Now, where charges can be either positive or negative, uh, magnets have these things called poles. And they're known as the North Pole and the South Pole. Well, where'd they get those names? Well, it has a lot to do with the way and why a compass works. A compass is designed to show you the direction towards the geographic North Pole of the Earth and the geographic South Pole of the Earth. And why does it do that? Well, it has to do with the way that poles interact with each other, which is very similar to the idea of the way electric charge works with each other. Here, like poles will repel each other and opposite poles will attract each other. Now, you probably already know this. You probably played with magnets and find that in some cases they will click together, they will come together, and you turn them around the other way and they'll push apart. Okay, and that has to do with the way these poles work. Now, for example, here on the Earth. The Earth is essentially one gigantic magnet. Okay? Now, why is it such a big magnet? Well, for one reason, uh, one very big reason, is the Earth, when it formed, um, there were certain metals, three in particular. Fe, which stands for iron. Co, which stands for cobalt. And Ni, which stands for nickel. You'll learn a lot of that in chemistry, those little symbols. Um, these are very dense, heavy metals. And when the Earth first formed, it was more of a liquid all around with a very, very, very thin crust. So a lot of these heavier metals fell towards the center of the Earth. Okay, they simply sank down there. And it turns out that three, these three metals are something that is called ferromagnetic. Okay. And something that is ferromagnetic is naturally magnetic, okay. naturally highly magnetic. So our Earth is rich with a lot of these three metals in the center of it, and they're just naturally magnetic materials. Now we'll get into what makes something naturally magnetic. Um, and that sort of creates that magnet inside the Earth. Now, in a way, it's acting like this thing called a bar magnet, okay, where... Um, it kind of gives the Earth this sort of magnetic look to it. Now, a compass works on sort of the same idea. The compass actually has a magnet. The needle itself is a physical magnet. Um, and it has that sort of north and south on it, designed to point north and south on the Earth. But there's something kind of interesting about that idea. Notice that in this picture of the Earth, the south is up here near the top and the north is down here towards the bottom. Well, that's so the compass can work right. Now, really, what you call north and south is a little bit arbitrary, but we call it this for the earth because in order for our compass needle to point north, the north pole of the needle needs to be attracted to the south pole of the earth, okay? And the south pole of the needle towards the north magnetic pole. Okay, so these are magnetic poles, which are very different from geography. See, what we call the geographic North Pole is up here at the top, and the geographic South Pole is down here at the bottom. But the magnetism is different. Now, there's also something very interesting. The actual location of this South Pole is somewhat represented correctly here. It's actually in Canada, um, which means that if you take your compass and you start going north, 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 now it's, you know, we're going along the globe here. Okay, it's nicely pointing north, and all of a sudden, whoops, you get up towards the Arctic Circle, and it's now pointing you down towards Canada. Um, so when people first 
learned how to use compasses, they had to know actually what line of latitude they were on the planet, and in fact in the military still have to do this, uh, in order to sort of add or subtract from their compass reading to know which way was still true north. Um, of course now we have GPS, it kind of eliminates that need for all the rest of us, but you know, some people still have to know that. Okay, so as you can see, north attracts to south, south attracts to north in terms of poles, not geography, in terms of magnetic poles. Now, the other thing that makes the Earth um, such, so magnetic, having that magnetizability, is not just those metals. Because, for example, um, Venus has those same metals in its core, and yet it doesn't really have much in the way of magnetism. It turns out the other thing is the rotation of the Earth. See, all those metals are down in this sort of liquidy area of the Earth. And so as the Earth spins, they all move. They rotate with the Earth which leads to probably the most important concept in magnetism itself. It turns out that all magnetism is simply the result of moving electric charge. Okay? This is an extremely important idea. There would be a stationary charge, if you had something where charges were frozen, it wouldn't be magnetic. So again, with the Earth, that rotation, moving all of those metals together, helped create a magnetic field for the Earth. Venus turns to so slow I think one day on Venus is actually 247 Earth days. So it turns so slowly that it can't get all of that stuff to move very well and doesn't create really any magnetism. So all magnetism is the result of moving electric charge. This is actually discovered by a guy named Oersted um, using kind of a compass and electric wire was able to prove that this is true. Now, again, this is what separates something from being a magnet and not being a magnet. You see, Inside any object, even in solids, of course, there are those charges that exist with it. And in something that is not magnetic, those charges kind of move very randomly. Okay? Now, each little charge has a bit of magnetism because it's moving charge. But what's interesting is what happens within the charges inside a permanent magnet. Um, they're what are called aligned domains fancy name for it. But they all are sort of aligned and kind of moved together. So as you can see here, in something that is actually a magnet, these charges, it's like each little charge is its own mini magnet. And because they're all aligned together and they all move as one, okay, they kind of move around as one, this creates something that is permanently magnetic. Now, interestingly enough, you can take something that is not naturally a magnet, and place it on a permanent magnet. For example, if you take a paper clip, it's a piece of metal, um, and you place it on a permanent magnet, these charges inside the thing that is not magnetic, like the paper clip, will start being attracted to the tiny little magnetism in the permanent magnet. You can temporarily make a magnet. So this would be a temporary magnet. Now, it won't last very long, okay, because those things aren't naturally able to maintain that sort of magnetism, so eventually they'll lose it. Um, interesting enough, you can destroy a permanent magnet's magnetism. Um, think about it, it's moving charge. So if you run electricity through a magnet, you will disrupt that electrical movement. That's one way to do it. Um, also, force. If you hit or drop the magnet enough, the force's impact is felt all the way down to those charges, and they'll start shaking out of their alignment. Uh, another way is heating. If you heat a magnet, um, it will get hotter and hotter, and that will start those charges moving very randomly, ruining that magnet. Okay. Now, probably one of the most fascinating things about a magnet, and what makes it very, very different from electric charge. Um, again, that magnet will have its north and south pole. If you break that magnet in half, each one of those halves will have a north and south pole. And in fact, you could break it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And you could break it all the way down to the very last moving charge. And even that last moving charge will have a north and south pole. So magnetism always comes in poles, in pairs. The fancy name is a dipole. All magnets are a dipole, okay, two poles. Now, you can have a single positive charge and a single negative charge, but you can't have a single poled magnet. Very different from charges in that way. Now, much like the way that charges have electric fields, planets have gravitational fields, 
magnets have magnetic fields. Okay? So again, now we're seeing three things that are very similar to each other. Gravitational fields, electric fields, and magnetic fields. They all are very similar. All of them can create action at a distance. All of them get weaker with distance. Um, so they're very, very similar in those particular fashions. The symbol for the magnetic field strength, how strong a magnetic field, is given by the letter B. Um, and the unit of magnetic field is a capital T for the Tesla. Named after Nikola Tesla, not the band Tesla. Google them, they were great in the 80s. Now, that means that any moving charge has two fields around it, an electric field and a magnetic field. And so, like dealing with electric fields, where we had electric field lines, for magnets, we can draw or show magnetic field lines. Um, now, magnetic fields are actually easier to show than anything because if you take a magnet and you get iron filings or metals and stuff like that, you can sprinkle them around and it'll actually show you what the field looks like. But to draw magnetic field lines, we came up again with some rules. First of all, magnetic field lines must begin on a north pole and end on a south pole. Much like the electric fields had to begin on positive and end on a negative. However, this is what's very different. Magnetic fields will move in circles around any moving charge or around a wire that carries a current. Okay, now that is very different from an electric field, this circular motion. But just like electric fields, no field lines can cross. So let's look at a couple of examples. So here, let's compare magnetic fields and electric fields. Now, if you remember from electric fields, if I have a positive and negative near each other, I must begin on the positive and end on the negative. Okay, something like that. Now again, you'll notice it kind of shows that attraction that is occurring there. For a magnet, I have to begin or come out of the North Pole and end or come into the South Pole. Now notice the field lines are much closer together at the poles than they would be if we come much further away from the poles. Now, what does that mean? Magnetic field strength is greatest at the poles. Magnetic field strength is greatest at the poles and weaker with distance. Um, when we had parallel plates, remember we had parallel plates that consisted of a charged positive plate and a charged negative plate. And the electric field went from positive to negative. And we also found out that the electric field was constant between those plates. Well, if I take two magnets and I put the north pole of one facing the south pole of the other, the magnetic field lines must run north-south. And here, in this case, our magnetic, our B field, would also be constant between those two points. If I had two positive charges and electric fields, well, I have to begin on positives, and my field lines weren't allowed to cross. Okay, so I got something like this. Well, for magnets, that would be similar to having two north poles. You would come out of the north, but you aren't allowed to cross. So again, it shows the two like poles repel. And of course, for negative charge, the field lines just went the other direction. The same thing if you had two south poles, the field lines would come in and end on the south pole. Yep. And that's basically the idea behind how that looks. However, if we just consider charges themselves in that second rule to magnetic field lines. Now, if we have a stationary positive charge, all it has is an electric field, okay, coming out everywhere towards infinity. But a moving charge, in addition to having that electric field, will have a magnetic field. Now, for a moving charge, the magnetic field runs in circles around that charge. Same thing if I have a current running through a wire. Now, a current is, of course, a lot of charge all at once. And so, again, I get these magnetic field lines that would run in circles around that. Now, it's not confined there. The circles continue outward, getting weaker and weaker with distance. Now, as we said, though, the Earth itself has a magnetic field. 
the Earth is essentially a giant magnet. And as you can see, it has this magnetic field that is sort of surrounding it. Okay, again, coming sort of out of the North Pole and into the South Pole. Um, and again, the strength of the field, okay, very high near the poles and then getting weaker and weaker with distance. Okay, uh, so that's sort of that magnetism, that magnetic field, um, what it looks around, like around the Earth. But that's not 100% true. You see, the Sun sends out a lot of radiation, these very highly charged particles, and they press on our Earth's magnetic field. And what that actually does is, well, our magnetic field kind of looks like this up front, but then from behind, it kind of tails off like a comet tail. Okay? And that's because these, this radiation that's coming from the sun is pressing and kind of dragging our magnetic field behind us. Now, it's a good thing we have that magnetic field because it helps to deflect a lot of those deadly radiation particles that actually would kill us if it actually hit us. Um, but what also happens is because the magnetic field is very powerful at the poles, some of these particles are drawn towards the pole where they collide. And in those collisions, you get a release of energy, particularly light. And what that's known as in the north is the northern lights, or the aurora borealis. And in the south, there are southern lights called the aurora australis. And that's the result of those particles slamming together inside our magnetic field. Now, very high up, though. It's very far away from us. Magnets, magnetic fields, have the ability to create force. But now let's review something. As we found out with gravity, one planet creates a gravitational field, but you need two masses to make a force. In electricity, one charge creates an electric field, but you need two charges to make an electric force. So one magnet creates a magnetic field, but you need two sets of magnets or two magnetic fields to create a magnetic force. So if we want to create any magnetic force, we need two magnetic fields. Always seem to need that two, just like gravity and electricity. So if we send a charge through a magnetic field, we get a magnetic force on that charge. Because the charge itself is a mini magnet, and if we pass it through another magnetic field, we get an actual magnetic force. Now, the way we determine that magnetic force is this. Magnetic force is BQV. V standing for the magnetic field strength, Q for the value of the charge, V for the velocity of the charge. So let's look at an example of what I'm talking about. So here I have a set of magnets where I have the north pole of one magnet facing the south pole of the other. Now as we've discussed, what that does is it creates a magnetic field, constant magnetic field, in between those poles. And I'm going to say that magnetic field strength is 0.5 Tesla. Now my charge is going to come along with a certain velocity of 4 times 10 to the 7th meters per second. Charges move very fast. Now remember, that charge itself has its own little magnetic field going around it. But it doesn't matter to me what that magnetic field strength actually is. Okay? Because when we take our equation for magnetic force, Fm is B Q B. The B, the magnetic field strength, is the greater magnetic field strength, which will be by magnets, because they're made up of millions of charges. Um, so it's going to be much more powerful than the lone charge's magnetic field. So I don't really care what the charge's magnetic field is for this. I only care what the magnet's magnetic field is. And now from here, that's just simply plugging in the numbers. I have a magnetic field of 0.5, a charge of 8 nanocoulombs. Now remember, nano is 10 to the minus 9. Okay, 10 to the minus 9. So a Q of 8 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, and a velocity of 4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second gives me a magnetic force of 0.16 Newton, which is actually very strong to act on a force. Not too complicated for that, right? But here's the other thing, though. Remember, force is a vector, so that's the magnitude of the force. But what about the direction of the force? Well, it turns out that the direction of the force would be in what we would call the negative z direction, okay? or into my paper, into my page. Okay? Um, if you consider math, 
Um, you've been told, of course, you have your y-axis and your x-axis. Okay? But there is a third dimension, because life is in 3D, called the z-axis. Okay? Um, basically, y being up and down, x being left and right, but z being kind of in and out, that 3D part. So the charge would actually be pushed further down into the paper, as a way of looking at this. Um, now, how do I know that? Well, we're going to discuss that next time when we talk about something called the right-hand rule. Okay, so that's our sort of introduction to the idea of magnetism. Uh, first of all, the most important concept, all magnetism is the result of moving charge. Um, there are two poles, north and south. Like poles repel, opposite poles attract. Uh, one thing can create a magnetic field, but we need two fields to create a magnetic force. And to calculate a magnetic force on a charge, we do magnetic force is BQV, field times charge times velocity. We'll see you next time.